We're continuing our series on vaccines with support from the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. Last week, we started covering the history of vaccine resistance, including backlash from the public. This week, we're moving on to incidents associated with vaccination and debunked issues that somehow continue to gain traction with no evidence under their feet. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. A significant portion of vaccine resistance likely stems from past issues with vaccinations. There are several examples of this dotted throughout the historical record, but what is often lost is that problems have rarely been rooted in the vaccines themselves. Instead, problems often stem from issues like contamination, storage, and production. One example comes from 1901, when 13 children in St. Louis died as a result of receiving contaminated diphtheria antitoxin. This, along with a tetanus outbreak linked to contaminated smallpox vaccine, led to federal regulation of biological products. The Biologics Control Act was introduced in 1902 and created the Hygienic Laboratory of the U.S. Public Health Service, which eventually became the National Institutes of Health. In 1928, a multi-use bottle of diphtheria toxin antitoxin mixture was improperly stored and reused in Australia, causing the death of 12 children. In 1929, a tuberculosis vaccine was unknowingly contaminated with a different tuberculosis strain being studied in the same lab, causing 72 deaths and many more illnesses. Shortly after the Salk polio vaccine was approved in 1955, some vaccinated children developed paralytic polio beginning in the arm where they'd been vaccinated, rather than the legs, which is common for polio. The vaccination program was temporarily suspended so that an investigation could take place. It turned out that the majority of these cases occurred in children given vaccine produced by a specific laboratory using production methods that failed to correctly follow SOX instructions, thus failing to completely kill the type 1 polio virus in the vaccine. Not all instances are in the distant past. Two infants died in Samoa in 2018 after receiving their MMR vaccines, stoking fear over the vaccine and contributing to a major measles outbreak. It was later determined, however, that the deaths were due to inappropriate mixing of the vaccine and not the vaccine itself. So, yes, there are risks associated with new technology, especially in the beginning. This, of course, applies to vaccines. But any appropriate discussion of vaccine-related risks should also account for the risk of not vaccinating. To this point, we'll just mention that the U.S. rubella outbreak in 1964, which resulted in over 2,000 deaths, it also exposed a lot of pregnant women to rubella, which is really dangerous during certain stages of pregnancy, and resulted in approximately 20,000 congenital rubella cases, meaning babies born deaf, deaf and blind, and more. Low vaccination rates led to measles outbreaks between 1989 and 1991, with 90% of fatalities occurring in those who had never been vaccinated. And in the aforementioned measles outbreak in Samoa, 83 deaths were reported as of January 2020, and 87% of those were in children younger than five. So yes, as a serious counterpoint, there are major risks associated with refusing vaccinations. And lastly, anti-vaccine sentiment is often spurred by misinformation, misunderstanding, and rumors. We'd be remiss not to bring up the famous Andrew Wakefield research claiming a link between vaccines and autism. That work was attracted due to several flaws, and numerous studies since then have failed to find a link between vaccination and autism. This case is pretty famous, and despite extensive debunking, continues to wreak havoc on public perception of vaccinations. We have focused entire episodes on it. It is not, however, the first example of wildly inaccurate claims about vaccination. An article published in the 1800s by an animal rights activist claimed that in the less than 100 years since Jenner had developed the vaccine, and I'm quoting, millions upon millions of sound and healthy human beings have been inoculated with the most loathsome pestilence, doomed to carry to the grave bodies wasted by consumption or marred and deformed by scrofula, cancer, and innumerable other ills. This was a common anti-vaccine argument, with many declaring that vaccines introduced diseases like syphilis, leprosy, polio, and cancer into the bloodstream of children. The kernel of truth within this is that poor medical practices did occasionally result in the transmission of secondary infections during vaccination. And though this is not thought to be acceptable by anyone and improved by medical standards now existing, 
It's important to note that these incidents were never related to the vaccine themselves and certainly didn't include things like cancer. This writer also noted that deaths from tuberculosis were higher in areas where vaccination was enforced. This was true, but as is the case for many anti-vaccination arguments, technically correct information was not being provided in context. As is pointed out in a 1967 article in the Bulletin of the History of Medicine, urban areas were generally pro-vaccination thanks to being centers of organized medical professions. These areas were also more prone than rural areas to high numbers of tuberculosis cases for all the reasons you might guess. More highly populated areas see more disease spread than lower populated areas. It's a classic example of mistaken correlation for causation. Other anti-vaccine writings claim that vaccination introduced a death-laden bioplasm into the blood that carried all the vices, passions, and diseases of the cow. To our great disappointment, detail was sorely lacking on what exactly the vices and passions of a cow might be, though the writer did liken vaccination to other destructive elements of society, including alcohol, tobacco, lust, and sensual love. And finally, Rumors associated with a personal and or emotional story often gain strong traction. When Benjamin Franklin's four-year-old son died of smallpox, rumors began to circulate that the child had contracted smallpox when he was inoculated against it. Fortunately, Franklin spoke out against this, saying that to his great regret, his son had not, in fact, been variolated. As a reminder, variolation refers specifically to inoculation against smallpox by taking smallpox matter from the scab and infected an individual and placing it into the open skin of an uninfected individual. As we mentioned in the first video of this series, it was common for two to three percent of variolated individuals to die from smallpox. However, as Franklin pointed out, the death rate for those who contracted the disease naturally was 20 to 30 percent. He addressed parents who refused variolation on the grounds that they would not be able to forgive themselves if their child died from it, saying that the same would be true for not inoculating a child that went on to die from the disease. So it was best to choose variolation, the less risky option. And of course, there are examples across history of individuals promoting generally useless treatments and cures in place of the apparent evils of vaccination. For example, one suggested that successful smallpox treatment involved wrapping a patient in a milk-soaked sheet, bathing them in linseed oil, and then applying dry flour. Others promoted the proper use of salt and judicious use of the true healing powers of nature itself. We're still waiting patiently for evidence that these and other cures are effective. And in the meantime, we remain baffled by the rejection of incredibly solid evidence of vaccine safety and efficacy. Over time, We've seen variations in the arguments, concerns, and supporters of anti-vaccine sentiment. The power and visibility of these sentiments has also fluctuated across history, sometimes located firmly on the outer fringes of mainstream societal opinion, and sometimes, like now, possessing an alarming grip on a larger segment of society. The evidence is so clear on the utility and overall safety of vaccines, especially when weighed against the safety of the diseases they prevent, Unfortunately, nuanced information is easily twisted and presented to play on the fears of even extremely rational people. This has certainly occurred with the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's what we'll be focusing on in next week's episode, the last of this series on vaccinations. We hope you'll join us. I know you enjoyed this episode, and you'll enjoy the rest of the episodes in the series, so go check out the playlist now and subscribe to the channel below so you miss nothing. You might want to like the episode too. We'd also appreciate it if you go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage and help support the show even in a global pandemic. I'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chen, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.